Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Alameda County Child Care and COVID-19 Health and Mental Health Supports webinar. Today is Thursday, May 21st, 2020. Before we get started, we'd like to go over some housekeeping items and functionalities for our attendees. We are offering Spanish and Chinese language interpretation for this webinar. Please follow the prompt on the screen to access this feature. I will give people a few moments to get this set up. This webinar tonight is being recorded. All attendees are muted throughout the presentation. The chat box is disabled. Please submit your questions through the Q&A box, which I will show you how to access on the next slide. At the bottom of your screen, you will see the chat icon, which has been disabled, and next to it, the Q&A icon. Click on that to access the Q&A box. You can view all questions from all participants on the questions tab, on the all questions tab. You can also ask your own question by typing it into the question box at the bottom. If you would like to submit your question anonymously, check the small send anonymously button at the bottom. If you submit your question anonymously, we will not be able to follow up with you offline if needed. You can view all of your questions on the My Questions tab on the right. And lastly, at the end of the webinar, you'll be redirected in your web browser to complete a short evaluation. We do appreciate your feedback to help us plan for future webinars. So before we get started tonight, we wanted to get a sense of who's here with us tonight and ask you all just three short questions and this will happen in a poll. So in a few moments, a question will appear on your screen. This our first question. In which setting type do you work? Are you working in a center-based program, a family child care hum, home, or I do not work in a child care program? I'm going to give folks a few moments to answer this question, and then I will share the results. Okay, just a few more moments and I'll end the poll. Okay, awesome. So it looks like we have almost 60% of our attendees tonight coming from center-based programs, about 27%, 27% um, in family child care home and a small percentage who um, are a part of our field in, in some way. Our next question. Where do you work in Alameda County? Are you in East County, which includes the cities of Dublin, Livermore, Pleasanton, and Sinol? North County, including Alameda, Albany, Berkeley, Emeryville, Oakland, and Piedmont, or South County, 
which includes Castro Valley, Fremont, Hayward, Newark, San Leandro, San Lorenzo, and Union City. Last call for votes or for responses. Okay, we got lots of representation in North County, about 46% of our attendees, 27% in East County and 28% in South County. Okay, and the last question that we have for all of you tonight What is the current status of the family child care home or center where you work? Are you open and currently caring for children on site? Open, currently implementing distance learning? Or your program is closed and not serving children at this time? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. Show results. So it looks like a lot of you are currently closed and not serving children at this time, 39%. 34 are implementing distance learning and 27% are currently caring for children on site. Um, just wanna say thank you and so much appreciation to all of you, whether open and currently serving children or not, and just appreciate all of the work you're doing um, during this uncertain, uncertain time in our county. Um, so thank you. Okay, with that, I would like to turn it over to Michelle Rutherford, our webinar moderator for tonight. Good evening and thank you for our child care frontline heroes. Um, welcome to our COVID response webinar number three. Uh, the health and mental health support uh, webinar. My name is Michelle Rutherford and I'm your moderator for this evening and I work with First Five. Next slide. So tonight's webinar will provide imp an important update information from the Department of Public Health and address two key initiatives for support for providers, both health and mental health consultation. These efforts have been designed to respond to needs we were hearing from you all in the field. And uh, specifically, you will hear from our, our key partner, Lily Cook from Samuel Merritt University, who will share with you a wonderful advanced student nurse field placement consultation opportunity for you to participate in. And you will also hear from um, Maria Coleman from uh, Alameda County Behavioral Health and uh, other folks who are supporting this effort around health and mental health consultation. The agenda will allow each presenter to share uh, important information with you. And if there are questions that you wish to ask, as um, Rowena already described, put those in the Q&A. Um, we hope to hit on some of the most common questions. And for those who cannot um, get to this evening, for those questions we can't get to this evening, we will work on getting an FAQ out to you after the webinar. Um, the slide deck and um, all of the resource links at the end of this webinar will be uh, provided to you via email um, post-webinar. 
So don't worry about taking notes and all that. Um, you'll have copies of everything. And the webinar is being recorded. So if you have friends and colleagues that missed tonight that you'd like to share that with, um, please feel free to, to um, do that, do so. We'll have that in the link that go, it goes to you on the follow-up email and it will be posted on the First Five website and, and probably links at the r, &R um, agencies as well. Next slide. So I just wanted to highlight for you uh, the efforts that have been going on for the past two months for the emergency response. The Alameda County um, Child Care Emergency Response Team has been working tirelessly, meeting daily and often multiple times a day uh, to coordinate a local response. The team includes key leadership from each of our R&R &R, uh, child care agencies and from First Five uh, Alameda and includes the team from the Alameda County ECE program and from the Department of Public Health, Lisa Erickson, who's on this call, this webinar tonight, and the Social Services Agency um, and the Alameda County Office of Education. And that team has been meeting tirelessly to uh, work on a number of issues in, in terms of res this response. Specifically, we have been focusing on the supply of childcare um, slots and opportunities for families that are needing to continue to work and essential workers and have done advocacy at the state level around uh, essential worker subsidies. And so those of you who are serving essential workers, we wanna make sure that you know that those workers um, have subsidies available to them, unlike, and it's not um, according to uh, their income like it is in normal times. So we just wanna make sure the word is out so that um, uh, uh, those essential service workers are supported. And right now that's supposed to continue until June 30th. We're also uh, coordinating communication and guidance from public health, CCL, or community care licensing, the Department of Education, and in, in, a, in an environment where things are um, changing quite frequently. So we've been surveying the field, and as you all should be aware, um, working on procurement of essential materials and supplies and getting things out to you. A lot of things were delivered last weekend, and, um, and then working on webinars and information like this and um, provider supports. And specifically, that's in that planning process, how we were able to come up with these responses um, and planned for tonight. The next slide. So the, our first presenter this evening, and we have a, a stellar lineup for you, um, is Dr. Lewis Gearling. Dr. Gearling is a board certified pediatrician who received his medical training at Louisiana State University in New Orleans and he completed his pediatric internship and residency at Children's Hospital in Oakland. Dr. Gearling spent much of his career serving children and families that are socio socioeconomically disadvantaged, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he has served 20 years as a consultant for the California Children's services programs and since 2020 has served in his current role as a full-time medical director at the CCS program in Alameda County. So Dr. Gerling, oh, and, and I will introduce Lisa when she's up. Actually, Lisa's going first. Oh, Lisa's going first. <laughs> I think I'm first, Michelle, no worries. That's Sorry, okay. Lisa. No Lisa problem. Lisa Erickson, our near and dear Lisa Erickson, is the Family Partnership and Elementary School Coordinator at the Center for Healthy Schools and Communities at Alameda County Health Care Services Agency, where she supports integrating and coordinating effective family partnership strategies in schools and communities. 
Uh, Lisa previously worked at, uh, has done a lot of work with families and children, both in the U.S. and around the world and abroad, and she came um, to this role um, from First Five, where she worked on quality counts and a lot of the um, professional development and innovative projects and, and programs for ECE. So she is well known to us, and we appreciate having her as an embedded troop um, in, in, during this pandemic. So thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to go to the next slide. I'll get started. Yeah, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you this evening. I just want to tell you, give you a quick uh, overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to first just do a, a brief uh, situation analysis, which is basically just showing you some of the COVID-19 data in the state and the county. And then I'm going to go over the California and Alameda County Roadmap to Resilience. Um, and then Dr. Gerling is going to talk about COVID-19 in children and then the testing, and then lastly, just how to keep children and staff safe um, during this COVID-19 pandemic. It's gonna be pretty high level. We're gonna link you to lots of resources so you can go, you know, get more in depth, um, but that's, those are the topics we're gonna cover. Thanks, next slide. So uh, this is a, a resource that you all have available to you every day. It's basically, it's, you can just Google, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle Coronavirus Tracker, and it gives you the data um, and shows you kind of the, um, the cases across the state. Uh, it's nice because you can kind of see where there's more cases in particular counties. It's a visual representation, which I like. Um, and just to kind of go through these cases, in the Bay Area right now, we have 11,426 cases. In California, there's 86,004. And the United States is one point, it's 1,556,749. Um, so oh, next slide. And so this is, uh, this is the Alameda County data. Uh, and I know this looks like a lot of information on the slide, but I wanted to show you um, this dashboard that uh, we recently created and it's on our website. So I definitely would highly recommend that you check it out. It's pretty easy to find. And it shows uh, the, the, the cumulative cases are on the left. And as you can see in Alameda County, we have 2,560 cases right now. And then on the right, it shows the daily cases. And then it also breaks it down by gender and age and you know, different demographics, race, ethnicity. So it's a really good resource for you to check that also gets updated daily. So this I think was updated. This is from yesterday, yesterday's data. Um, you will notice that the race ethnicity data, it's, it, there's a lot of uh, range between the different race and ethnicity. And I wanted to point out that we are working really hard on um, kind of the equity issues around this, um, around COVID-19. Uh, this pandemic definitely underscores the health disparities that have been happening in our county um, and the socioeconomic vulnerability experienced by many communities of color in our county. Uh, Latinx, African American, and Pacific Islander communities um, have higher rates of chronic disease um, and have, are, are more likely to work and live in conditions that make it difficult to physical distance or to shelter in place. Um, and so, and also something that we know is that the COVID-19 has been widespread in our county for a while and now that testing is increasing, um, those numbers are going up among these groups as well as across the county. And we're, what we're doing is we're using this data to really help target um, where we put our resources and to target messaging and interventions to make sure that we're addressing um, all the needs in the most affected communities. Uh, and we're trying to really um, better support people with their physical distancing and the isolation and quarantine, which can be difficult in particular communities. Thank you. Next slide. So this is the state, what they call the, resili uh, the Resilience Roadmap. Um, I'm sure you've heard Governor Newsom uh, on the news and in the media talking about these different stages. Um, and right now, and this is kind of the stages for, for opening up, for reopening up our economy and our workplaces. And right now we're in stage two, and this is the lower risk workplaces, um, opening up things like retail with curbside pickup, more public spaces, and looking at modified school programs. Um, and then in stage three, that will move more toward higher risk workplaces like personal care, hair and nail salons and gyms. 
and entertainment venues uh, like movie theaters and then sports without live audiences. And then last is stage four. And this is really when the, the entire workforce expands um, and you know, we can have concerts again and conventions and sports with live audiences. And this really requires that there be a vaccine or other therapeutics and treatments for COVID-19 to kind of move into this last, last phase of the resilience roadmap. Next slide. So this, the reason why I'm going to talk about the county variants is that there's been a lot of confusion between what's going on at the state and what's going on at the local level. So the way this works is that uh, which the, if the state's um, shelter at home is more restrictive, then we need to follow the states. If the counties is more restrictive, the policies, then we will follow the counties. So it's a little bit um, unclear sometimes, which is why I get a lot of calls during the week <laughs> answering these questions. Um, so stage two will be phased in gradually. Some communities are moving quicker through stage two. Others are, um, are uh, are showing greater, or so, so, sorry, some communities are moving through stage two faster and others are, are not moving as quickly. Um, this is all based on readiness criteria that I'm gonna be talking about in a couple of slides. Uh, and as you might've known, or as you've seen also in the media, that we have six Bay Area counties that are working together. Um, and our, our counties are a little bit slower than some of the other more rural counties in the state. We're about falling about two weeks behind some of the other counties in the state with what we're opening up. But I did wanna let y'all know tonight that uh, we are moving closer toward opening up childcare to serve all workers, not just those that are essential or those that are allowed to work outside the home in the order. So if all of our indicators are moving in the right direction, it looks like that we might be able to open up childcare even broader um, toward the beginning of June. Next slide. So right, so this is the Alameda County Resilience um, Roadmap. And in Alameda County, we are in early stage two. And this Monday, May 18th, um, we updated our shelter in place orders. And so now we're also allowing curbside retail, manufacturing, as well as warehousing. Um, and the, the health officer also issued um, a highly regulated vehicle-based uh, gathering order. Um, which will allow for religious gatherings as well as um, graduations. Oh. Um, you can also find all of this information on a new part of our website called uh, the, the COVID recovery. So I'm gonna kind of move through my slides a little quicker because <laughs> I've been told that I have, I'm running out of time. So. <laughs> so this is another dashboard I wanted to just point out. I'm not gonna walk through it all, but these are the really, these are important. These are the five indicators that we need to do well on in order to kind of move through our resiliency roadmap. Um, the first two are uh, the case hospital, hospitalizations and um, sufficient hospital capacity. Those two are doing really well. As you can see, they're green. Um, the testing capacity, we're doing pretty well. It's getting better. Our goal is to have uh, 3,000 tests a day. I think we're at about 1,000 right now, so we're about one-third of our way there to meeting that goal. Um, the other two are the sufficient disease containment. Um, disease containment, I'm just going to explain this really quickly because this is important for you all to know and understand. It, it involves case identification or testing and then isolating those cases that have been confirmed positive as well as doing contact investigation or contact tracing, which you guys have probably heard about, of all the close contacts of that particular case. And then um, making sure that those close contacts are quarantined. And then if there's another outbreak, we need to kind of go towards social distancing again. So it's an entire process. So we need to make sure that this process is well staffed and we're able to serve at least 90% um, of, our, of our confirmed cases with our disease containment. And then lastly, it's sufficient PPE or personal protective equipment. And the way that we measure this is if um, we, ha we, have some, we have a lot of it. We've been doing a lot better in this area, but we're still getting calls and, and requests from our hospitals. So if we don't get calls and requests from our hospitals for at least two weeks, that means that we can move into that green category on sufficient PPE. Next slide. Oh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gerling. Thank you, Lisa. Um, that was very nice. I appreciate your um, 
overview of what's happening in public health. What I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in children and a little bit about the symptoms and, um, and then uh, finishing up with um, some information about that multi-system inflammatory syndrome that you have heard about in the news. So first of all, um, nationally, about 2% of confirmed cases are in children between the ages of birth and 17 years. In California, that number's a little bit higher. It's 4.1%, but it's still quite low. Now, um, be aware that when we talk about confirmed cases, these are children that are either symptomatic or they were tested because they're part of a contact investigation such as Lisa just described. The overall prevalence in the population, meaning the overall percentage of people in the population who are, who are infected is not well understood because of limited testing. And it, this is particularly true in children whose symptoms generally are quite mild and so that they might not come to medical attention and seek testing. But in spite of all of those caveats, we do think that the attack rate for COVID-19 is, is low in younger children. Next slide, please. Next slide. So the symptoms of COVID-19 in children are actually similar to other viral respiratory infections like colds and the flu. The majority of children with COVID-19 either have no symptoms at all or their symptoms are very mild. They have a fever, they have sore muscles and aches, and maybe a little cough and runny nose. Now, a, a smaller number of children will go on to develop moderate disease with pneumonia or severe disease, which is characterized as having shortness of breath with low oxygen levels, respiratory distress, and possibly multiple organs um, that are not functioning normally. Children rarely need to be hospitalized, but those who do are usually under the age of one year or they usually have chronic underlying medical conditions such as asthma or other chronic lung diseases cardiovascular diseases, and suppressed immune function. Next slide, please. These data, next slide. Sorry, I think we're, I think we're, we've, you've jumped ahead. We're back at the slide that says frequency of symptoms. Need to back up two slides. There we go. Okay, so these data were uh, reported by the CDC in early May, and it's, it's just a table showing you the various symptoms of COVID-19 on the left-hand side. And then the first column is the frequency of those symptoms in children, and the last column is the frequency in adults. This was a large study with almost 300 children and 11,000 adults. And with the exception of runny nose, all of the symptoms are reported considerably less frequently in children as compared with adults. And this is particularly striking for fever, cough, and shortness of breath, which are the common symptoms reported in adults. So you can see, if you look carefully, that um, fever was, for example, present in only 56% of children, whereas in adults it was 71%. And very striking is shortness of breath, present in only 13% of children, whereas it's present in 43% of adults. So uh, a broader range of symptoms needs to be considered when we're screening children for uh, possible COVID-19. But we also have to understand that many of these children will not have the same symptoms or at least not at the same frequency that we see in older children or adults. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> There's a, a, a major research question right now, and that is how many people have no symptoms at all, that's they're asymptomatic. How frequently are people pre-symptomatic, meaning that they, they have infection, but they have no symptoms, they don't know it, or maybe they are minimally symptomatic, meaning that they just have a little bit of a runny nose, they feel like they're pretty well, and yet um, are they able to spread disease? And so um, there's a lot of research on this. We're gonna talk a little bit about this. But several studies already have shown that the virus can be cultured from the respiratory tract of people before symptoms develop. 
And there are several documented cases where pre-symptomatic people were known to transmit the disease and become the center of small outbreaks in China, Germany, and Singapore. So this is a very important um, fact that, that um, people can spread COVID-19 before they are actually uh, uh, exhibiting symptoms. And sometimes they may be able to spread it and, and never exhibit symptoms. Right now, the CDC is telling us that we should consider the 48 hour period before the onset of symptoms as a, as a contagious period for these people, uh, although they are more likely to spread the disease when they do become symptomatic and they start coughing and sneezing and releasing a lot of droplets into the environment. Um, so the, because of this possibility of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spread, it's really important for us to continue with our physical distancing, our use of cloth face coverings in public, and universal masking in healthcare facilities, um, even for people that do not have any symptoms. Next slide, please. Okay, this is an interesting study that um, came out of China. Um, and it, it's a relatively small study of 74 children. But um, these were all children that were positive uh, for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And among these 74 children, 27% were asymptomatic, they had no symptoms at all, 32% were mildly symptomatic, and 39% uh, uh, had pneumonia and only 1% were severe. But the point of showing you this slide is that if you add up the asymptomatic and the very mildly symptomatic children, that's nearly 60% of the children who had either no symptoms or very minor symptoms like you would see with the common cold. Next slide. Now, as I've said, this is an important research study and people all are or research question and people all over the world are trying to understand the role of children in spreading COVID-19. We know with influenza that children are one of the major factors in spreading COVID-19. They catch it in congregate settings in schools and childcare and so forth. They bring it home to their families, they give it to their parents, their grandparents, and they become the, the sort of center of the um, uh, of the outbreak very frequently. And when we vaccinate children, children against the flu, we see the rates of flu in the community drop. The question is, is that true for COVID-19? And so far, we're not really sure, but it, we don't really think so. Um, so uh, some of the studies show that children uh, have a lower attack rate, that they have fewer symptoms, that they may not spread uh, the, the uh, virus as efficiently, to other children um, compared with older children and adults. Um, so what I'm gonna tell you is that um, in Iceland, um, this is the only study that I have seen that was a really robust prevalence study looking at, at um, infection rates in a large swath of the population with and without symptoms. And for the patients that are the people that had either symptoms or a known exposure or a risk factor like travel to a foreign country where an outbreak was in progress. What they found among children was that 6.7% were positive if they were under the age of 10, and 13.7% were positive if they were over the age of 10. So that's an interesting observation because what it, what it suggests is that the attack rate is lower in the younger children who were infected half as frequently with the same risk factors. Um, and then very interestingly, in the community sample where they just, they, they tested people who did not have symptoms or risk factors, they didn't find any children under the age of 10 that had COVID-19 and a very small number between the ages of 10 and, and 19. So that really suggests that we may not have a lot of community transmission happening uh, as a result of um, children being infected. Um, there was also an Asian study that documented that uh, in among household clusters of COVID-19, only 10% of those uh, could be traced back to a child as the index case. And that compares, um, interestingly, with 54% in the case of influenza. So it's much less frequently in that study that you would see a child as the index case. However, on the flip side, there was a study in Hong Kong which showed that the transmission rates in the community um, began to drop very fast almost immediately when schools were closed. And there was a French study 
that showed where, where they looked at a community that was heavily affected by COVID-19 and they measured antibodies in a large group of, um, uh, of the population, uh, in, including all of the children and all of the teachers and all of the staff at a high school, as well as their family contacts. And what they found was that 40% were positive if they were associated with the school, meaning they were a student there or a staff person there, but only 10% uh, were positive if they were contacts back in the household. And that suggests that a lot of the transmission was happening at school. So you can see that these different studies are, are, are coming back with sort of different results. And we are all trying to piece this together to understand what it means for childcare, elementary school and high school. Next slide. So um, I wrote this as a conclusion, uh, knowing that there's still many questions. We know that children may not be at the center of most case clusters, but they, they can spread the disease to others. And the older they are, it seems the more likely that is to happen. And the more symptomatic they are, the more likely that is to happen. But this, um, this fact ex underscores the uh, continued importance of excluding children with symptoms compatible with COVID-19 from childcare, and then quarantining exposed persons, including children, and continuing with rigorous infection control, even if no one in your childcare is symptomatic. Okay, next. Okay. Um, so I just have two more slides. And what I wanna to talk to you about is this new condition known as multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome in children, MISC. You might also see the British name, which is Pediatric Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome, PMIS. Um, this disease was uh, initially reported in Italy and then the United Kingdom. And as of the 12th of May, 102 cases were under investigation in New York. And now we see some cases appearing in California. This is a very rare condition, which we have just recently in the past few days made reportable to public health, which means that if a physician makes this diagnosis, he or she must report it to public health within 24 hours so that we can gather more information about this disease and understand it better. Next slide, please. Okay, what we do know so far about this condition is that it's quite rare. Um, and it seems to appear in a community about a month after there is an outbreak in the community or an epidemic locally. That suggests that this is probably a, an overactive or disordered immune response to COVID-19. Um, the risk factors for this condition are currently unknown, but most of the cases have been reported in children who were otherwise healthy. Um, and many of the cases, uh, the children test negative by PCR, meaning that they can't detect the virus for COVID-19, but they test positive for antibodies, meaning that they were infected in a, previously within the prior month. And uh, some, some of those who don't test positive for antibodies um, actually uh, have known household exposure to COVID-19. So we think it is a late manifestation of the disease uh, with an overactive immune system. These children present with a prolonged fever and other symptoms that include the ones you see here. Often quite prominent among those symptoms is severe abdominal pain and vomiting. Unfortunately, next slide. Many of these children develop shock, which is a very low blood pressure with inadequate circulation. They often have a cardiac injury, even at the time that they present. That injury may include um, enlarged coronary arteries, and there may be dysfunction of multiple organ systems that's very serious, and these children often end up in the pediatric intensive care unit at a children's hospital. The best treatment is unknown at this time. Um, I heard a few days ago that in Europe, there is a multinational study called the, the BAT study, the best available treatment study is what BATS stands for, where essentially what they're doing is they're asking skilled, um, pediatric clinicians to, to make their best guess as to what the appropriate treatment is, and then to submit the results um, anonymously through this, um, or not anonymously, but in a de-identified way so that they, they won't know which child we're talking about, but they know which provider is reporting um, in order to determine which providers are having the best results. Uh, that will help us to decide how to treat these children. Um, I do wanna reassure you that as, although it's very serious, this condition is quite rare and um, 
that's all I wanted to cover. I'm turning this back over now to Lisa. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Gerling. It's a privilege to have you uh, telling us all this information that we don't usually get to hear. We read about it in the newspaper, but it's nice to hear it directly from a professional. <laughs> Um, so I just want to tell you, uh, oh, the next slide, a little bit about testing. I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but I wanted to, you know, we're trying to expand our testing sites and we have three new sites that are, um, online now, two in East Oakland at Allen Temple Baptist Church, as well as Roots Community Health Center, and then one in Ashland Cherryland at the Reach Youth Center. So these are, um, I, all of our testing sites can be found on our website. And there's also a, a, a resource that's on the back of this webinar that has a long list of all of the different um, testing sites. Sometimes our website is a little tough to navigate, which is why we wanted to pull out some of these important resources and put them in the webinar. Uh, so you can go ahead and access there. I did want to let you know that testing is free, um, either through your healthcare provider or health plan um, or a community testing site. Um, people who are insured should go to their health care provider. Um, otherwise, you can go to one of these community um, clinics or testing sites. Um, for most people, testing is primarily for people that have symptoms. Um, but in some cases, you know, for um, frontline workers, healthcare workers, you can get tests. Um, we're also working on putting childcare as kind of part of one of those priorities for public health, because you all are frontline workers, as Michelle said at the beginning of the webinar. So. And we want to have those tests available to you all as well. Um, most sites require an appointment, um, but there are a couple that don't. And again, please access that our website that has a lot of testing resources. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide. I think all of you probably know a lot of the information in this slide already, but I did want to remind you to, um, there's an uh, Alameda County Public Health FAQ, Child Care FAQ that's translated into Spanish and Chinese, and it spells out all of our public health guidelines. That's also as part of the resources, and hopefully you've all already seen that and read that. But these are our basic um, kind of um, guidelines for um, operating childcare right now. Um, that you'd be in stable groups of 10 to 12, and again, 10 is what licensing recommends, um, and then 12 is for um, like camps and things that aren't regulated by um, licensing. And if you have more than one group of children cared for at one facility, you have to keep them in separate rooms. And then lastly, child care providers should remain solely with one group of children. And this is important, um, and you'll probably hear people talking about this, is that this is really helping us um, limit the co-mingling of various households. So it's keeping kids within a bubble, or that's what we call it, a stable group or a bubble. And the idea is to kind of slowly move from your family bubble into kind of these other bubbles in the community, but to have that bubble be, you know, safe and very stable. Um, so it decreases the risk of transmission and it, it makes it easier to do contact tracing, which is what I was talking about earlier, to find out, you know, who has come in contact with someone if there were to be a positive case. Next slide. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but uh, screening is going to be really important for your child care. Um, and that's information about our screening is also in the FAQ I mentioned, and there's lots of resources in this webinar that you can look at. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have um, this nursing consultation program to really help with the screening process. Um, so I won't read through all the details on the slide. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that if a person is suspected of having COVID or has, or has COVID, um, they really shouldn't return to your program until, um, you know, they should be isolated at home and they shouldn't return until their respiratory, sy respiratory symptoms are improving, until they've had no fever um, without any sort of fever reducing medicines for at least 72 hours and they've been without um, illness or it's been 10 days since um, past since their illness onset. So keep that in mind. And then the last slide I have. Um, is just <laughs> cleaning and disinfecting, which I think you all could be teaching all of us about that. <laughs> you all are the pros, the experts at cleaning and disinfecting. And I can tell you that when camps call me, I'm referring them to child care resources because you guys do this all the time. Um, I know you know how to do it, um, but we do have a lot of information, again, in that FAQ and lots more resources from the CDC 
and the UCSF Child Care Health Program. And again, the nurse consultants can hopefully help you with um, these uh, cleaning and disinfecting practices. And I think that's all I have um, for tonight. But remember to visit our website and you should have my phone number as well. And you can always call me. My phone number is in that FAQ that I keep mentioning and it's on the website. Um, call me with any questions. Um, and thank you. And thanks for all the work that you all are doing, allowing everyone for society to really like happen, for everyone to go back to work. We really appreciate it. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Gerling. That was so helpful. Um, and it's so perfect to have it just targeted to our providers in our county about how things are working and um, what they need to be watching out for. Um, so th thank you for that. And again, everyone, you'll, you'll be getting that um, in a follow-up email. So next we have uh, Lily, Lily Cook, who is a pediatric nurse practitioner and assistant professor at Samuel Merritt University School of Nursing. We're so excited about our partnership with Samuel Merritt. Um, Lily has, has worked as a nurse in the Bay Area for over 30 years, and she's been teaching pediatric nursing at SMU for 16 years. Her areas of expertise are pediatric cardiology, child development, and social aspects of pediatric health. So Lily's, Lily's gonna walk you through um, our uh, health consultation. Hi, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, so I want to just thank Alameda County um, ECE for work on this collaboration. I have to tell you if there is any silver lining in this whole pandemic, it's been my ability, my opportunity to work with Alameda County Early Childhood Education. My students were in the middle of um, clinical um, and pediatric in their pediatric rotation when um, shelter in place occurred and they were all thinking they weren't going to get any more education done. But this is making me so excited to be able to have my students working with Alameda County um, to not only learn about children, but also help with this pandemic. Next slide, please. So our goal, our main goal for uh, the Alameda County and Samuel Merritt um, collaboration is really to have the nursing students provide health support for Alameda County child care providers of essential workers. At this point, it's essential workers, and hopefully this is going to expand as we're opening up more and more child care centers. I really do see this as a two-way street, and I think as we've talked over the weeks in putting this program together, uh, we really have found that it is a two-way street where the nursing students are being able to provide support and education and training and resources related to COVID-19 and related to general uh, health for the providers. And then on the same hand, the students are going to be able to learn something. They're learning about development, they're learning about the health needs of young children, and they're learning about this from people who are experts. Um, in some of my conversations with some of the providers, you've been doing this for 10, 15, 30 years, and your expertise is going to be really valuable for my students. Um, I'm the lead RN in this, and I'm going to be making sure, along with my students, that the providers are getting updated information, both from CDC and from Alameda County Public Health, related to the guidelines um, for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So the overview of what this project is going to look like is kind of in general, and there's a lot of details that we'll be able to talk with you guys about um, at length as we get closer to the time. But we're pl our plan is to have two student nurses assigned to either a center or an FCC, and that number can vary, but our, our plan right now is to have two students um, assigned to the providers to provide infection control, health teaching, screening, and all of those sort of things. What we expect it to look like is they would be on site in the morning, usually for you know four-ish hours. Um, that's kind of the time it will allow for drop-off and screening in the beginning, as well as a lot of um, infection control um, modeling and things like that during the during the morning hours. Um, we will have the students there at two days two days a week, and it's just going to be for three weeks. Um, this is a pilot. We're starting this out for three weeks um, in June. It's going to start um, the early middle of June, and that's going to be sort of our first group of students. But we've got many, many nursing students 
that are interested in doing this. And so we're hoping that this is going to expand to be a lot bigger project than, than just this first pilot. Um, there also is a potential for the possibility for virtual check-ins by phone um, and or video conferencing. I know some, um, some of the FCCs and centers have said, hmm, not sure if we want someone to actually come in, but we sure could use some of that information. And we're really open to that, to working with you and finding out what's going to be the best for you. Next slide, please. Real important for me to say that safety is our primary factor here. The student nurses are going to be implementing all kinds of safety measures to reduce exposure. I know some people are concerned about having one or two more people coming in there, but the students will be continuously following all of the safety precautions and the guidelines put forward by CDC and by Alameda County Public Health. They will always have their documentation with them that the licensing board requires. Um, they will be wearing masks continually and PPE, other PPE as, um, as needed. They will be meticulously and vigorously washing their hands and, sanitize, and, and doing sanitizing practices, as well as maintaining physical distancing as much as is possible with um, a bunch of toddlers, which can be easier said than done sometimes. Um, we'll also limit the amount of time that the, and the number of students that are going to be on site. Our plan is to have two students on one site for the whole three weeks. So it's not like we're going to be rotating students through. Um, it will also give them a chance to get to know the providers and to get to know the students, but the children, um, but also really decrease the um, risk of exposure. Next slide, please. So what we're planning on is that the students will have an RN supervising them. So though I'm over the whole organization, there's going to be four other of the project, there will be four other RNs that will be supervising the nurses, the students. And they will first contact the providers and find out what their needs are and let them know more specifically what the role of the student nurse is. Then we will be having the assigned student nurses meet virtually with a child care provider to kind of do a needs assessment. What are your needs? Are your needs more related to sanitizing? Are your needs more related to screening? Is it related to teaching the children how to, you know, cough into their sleeve and how to wash their hands. So we'll kind of find out what the important things are to be able to identify. Um, we have the ability for calls and web conferences, other kind of uh, virtual contact, if that's something that's going to be working well. Um, we will be matching students with um, languages spoken at the childcare sites as much as we can. Um, I, at this point, I just have pulled all my students and we have students that are speaking Spanish, Tagalog, Mandarin, Farsi, Dari, and a few different African languages. So hopefully we're going to be able to get some students with you that speak your language, that speak your language or your, chil your students, your children's language. Next slide, please. Um, the students will, as I said, they'll be talking with the provider forehand, beforehand and then finding out, like I said, what are the things that are best for us to be giving them? Is it going to be information flyers? Is it going to be making that wonderful FAQ sheet that Lisa has put together into like a one pager so people can just grab it and, you know, so maybe the families can see it? Is it related to games or activities, arts and crafts that have to do with infection control? They will also be helping at drop off in the morning. So my students will be there early in the morning to assist providers with not only their daily self assessment assessment of their environment and themselves and, and the other staff there, but screening the children, looking at their symptoms, taking their temperatures and things like that, and then also helping with, um, with any environmental um, sanitizing that needs to happen. Next slide, please. Then during the day, uh, what they're going to be doing is activities that are really going to support health and safety practices for the children. And this can be in the form of playing with the children, um, story time, songs about infection control, how to wash their hands, how to cough into your sleeve, masks, how to not smear their mucus all over each other, which is kind of what toddlers love to do. Um, and they will also make sure to be supporting the staff to implement whatever the new CDC and um, Alameda County Public Health guidelines are. As um, Dr. Gruling and Lisa were saying, these are changing daily. And so for, for the providers to keep up with this is really hard. And that's what we want to be able to be there to help you with. Um, so whether that's related to social distancing, whether that's related to cleaning procedures, sick child procedures, any of those sort of things. Next slide, please. 
And then hopefully the students will be, and again, this is kind of if it's going to work, we'll be doing something a little bit more formalized as far as teaching. And I'm not talking about a big 20 minute PowerPoint presentation. I'm talking about some kind of play that they could do that maybe is, is highlighting one particular aspect, like washing their hands, like learning songs to wash their hands so they've got the right number of seconds to wash their hands, put glitter on their hands, they have to wash the glitter off, different things like that. And then we can do a lot of other things related to general health. As you can see in some of these pictures, these are some of the classes my students have taught before, um, helping with bicycle safety. This, I love this little one in the upper left. This was a, um, a puppet show that someone had with their dolls and masks on them. But other things related to safety, nutrition, and things like that. So we're really open to do whatever is going to be helpful for the providers. Last slide, please. This is just a list of lots of the different things that we have done before. Um, we've done a lot related to nutrition and health, and I just want this to be something that's going to be valuable for the providers. We are definitely there at this point to help with the providers related to infection control and all of the issues that, ha that have come up related to COVID. Um, but we also are really there and hopefully will be there for, for the long period of time past this, this pandemic to help facilitate um, other health um, health and safety issues with children. So um, thank you very much and I look forward to working with you. I'm going to turn this back over to Michelle, I guess. Thank you, Lily, and, and for all of your partnership in this. We're really excited about um, the potential for this, not just in the immediate um, urgent kind of environment, but really health consultation and childcare is something that's really valuable um, ongoing. And so we're really excited about the partnership and, and uh, understand that, that this will be rolling out soon and uh, folks will be hearing about it and be able to apply if they're interested. So they should be looking for that. So next we have uh, Maria Coleman from uh, Alameda County behavioral health, and she's going to provide an overview of our mental health consultation. Um, Maria's been a great partner and has been uh, provided direct mental health consultation to preschool in Alameda County. Alameda has a great history of mental health consultation, um, and uh, Maria's been in this work for 20 years, and she's been a trainer in the field of mental health consultation for 15 years, and has worked with children, early childhood and adolescents, and families as a therapist for 29 years. And we're really fortunate to have her as a partner. Um, take it away, Maria. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you all for being here this evening. I'm happy to be here with you to share a little bit more about mental health consultation services. And as Michelle was speaking to, um, mental health consultation has been a service that we have provided here in Alameda County for more than 20 years to um, our centers, our FCCs. Um, yet, I know a lot of you um, are not aware of it. And so, um, of, of what these services are. So, what I would like to do is to share with you what mental health services consultation services um, provide. Next slide, please. So mental health consultation services can include support to child care providers to help with transitions and social emotional needs for children receiving care from infancy through school age. And can also include supporting you as child care providers and staff in navigating um, this whole new world in terms of emergency care environment and um, with young children from birth to school age. Next slide, please. So there are a few ways I'd like to highlight in which mental health consultation um, can be of support to you all. Um, so, in working with a mental health consultant, some of the discussions um, and, and meetings that you will have can include um, discussions around classroom management, 
which includes transitions, circle times, um, developmental appropriate activities with young children, um, parent-teacher communication, teacher-teacher communication, culture and diversity issues, and just the overall emo social and emotional needs of young children um, that are in the care of your environment as a whole. And that would be considered general consultation. And then discussions and meetings with consultants can also include um, issues around um, management and, our, and or um, systemic and infrastructural issues that are impacting your environment. And that really speaks to policies and procedures. So with respect to all of the information and the ever-changing guidelines from the state, from child care licensing that all of you are trying, to, um, are trying to manage right now and figure out. And so a consultant can support you in helping to think through, well, how is this gonna impact my, my environment, the, the children and the families that I'm serving, how is that going to impact my staff? And as well as how does that impact the overall morale of your staff? And that would be considered program consultation. And a consultant can also support with advocacy and referral services. So you may have families who um, are in need or struggling children that are in your program who are struggling and you may have identified that there's some mental health support that this child and family is needing and in your discussions with the consultant can talk more about what particular type of mental health support the family or the child might need and so it can look like that can also include linkage to other community resources and or needs that you and the consultant as your meeting can um, think about together and connect that family to. Next slide. So then what's the process of getting connected to mental health consultation services? So there'll be an initial intake, which will include a needs assessment with the center or FCC provider that will be conducted by a representative from Alameda County Behavioral Healthcare, which would be myself and or someone from Hively. Then soon after that initial intake needs assessment is done, you will be assigned a mental health consultant. That consultant will contact you within two business days to schedule a meeting with you. And, and your staff. And then meetings with a consultant can be one day per week for one to one and a half hours. Yet I, that varies based upon the need, based upon the availability of the consultant. So that all can be figured out and negotiated based upon what your needs are of yourself and your staff. Um, Consultations may occur at one-to-one -one or in small groups with child care staffs or teams um, or with other similar providers. And then meetings will be held virtually um, via the phone or video conferencing. And then some of the mental health consultation services that are being provided are short term. I think it's important for all of you to know that and will be ending as of June 30 of 2020. And that's Thank you so much, Maria, for that overview. Um, we have Kelly, uh, Lagduka Dulka, um, who is the head of Hively, and she's a licensed clinical social worker with over 30 years of experience working with children and families. Kelly graduated from UC Berkeley, where she received both undergraduate and graduate degree in social wel welfare. She did her clinical training at Stanford, where she was the founder of the Stanford University Medical Center Sexual Abuse Clinic. 
She is an expert in trauma-informed care and a champion for you all around trauma-informed practice and is uh, a child abuse prevention national advocate. Uh, Kelly is, Kelly's uh, agency, um, Kelly ser serves as the chief executive officer at Hively, which is one of our three Alameda County R&Rs, um, and, and is a state contracted AP agency, and also has a mental health uh, programming division. And Hively has stepped up to help partner with us um, to provide these services. And Kelly, uh, we asked Kelly if she could talk a little bit about um, the work that they are doing amidst COVID. Kelly? Thanks, Michelle. Um, I am excited to be here with all of you tonight in this uh, capacity. Uh, we've spent the last month or so listening to providers like you all um, in various listening sessions, in trauma trainings, and in other of our outreach efforts. And we've heard your strong desire for these mental health consultation services. And we're really excited to be partnering with uh, Alameda County Behavioral Health Care Services and especially with Maria, with the vast information, the vast experience she brings to this uh, work that we're partnering together to do. Um, we've heard from child care providers that you're anxious about your own health as you welcome kids into your centers and even into your homes. Um, you're also concerned with the way you're now interacting with kids. We've um, heard many stories about um, your own fears and anxieties about kids seeing you differently now that you'll be in masks, now that you have to keep a distance from them. Um, and we've also heard a lot from you all about the stress that your families are under. Um, we've heard of um, extreme cases of uh, in increases in domestic violence, in child abuse, and uh, things that you're worried about uh, being able to navigate as you manage your own anxiety around COVID-19. So these services are really um, a pilot to see how we can better serve our child care providers. Um, to help you with your own stress and anxiety, because we know this is very stressful for everyone. And then to also uh, recognize that the families you serve are desperately in need of additional support during this time. So um, we're, uh, we're really looking forward to initially bringing services through June 30th, and we're hoping as R&Rs to secure additional funding to be able to extend, the, to extend these services um, into the next fiscal year. Thanks, Kelly. That, and, and I just want to add that absolutely, we, we know that this, the need doesn't end June 30th, clearly. Um, so there, there will be advocacy, both at the state level and then thinking about how can we use existing resources um, for this effort, um, and, and depending on the response and, and to the extent they all are finding it helpful. Next slide. So this is the uh, an interest form online for um, the application for mental health consultation. Many of you heard about this webinar through um, the flyer. Next slide. And in Spanish. And we are working right now trying to find a, a Mandarin speaking clinician. If anyone knows of someone, please send them our way. Kelly's been recruiting statewide and um, we're, we're having a lot of difficulty with, um, with that language. So, um, but we haven't forgotten you. We're still working on it. Next slide. So now we're going to have um, some Q and A. Except my Q and A is not here. So let me ask uh, to Lisa. Can you just talk about the advantages, um, health-wise, of programming indoors versus outdoors? So that is a question that came up. Sure. Um, so outdoors is always better, which I'm sure um, 
many of you have read and heard about because there's just more ventilation. Um, if there are, yeah, germs and droplets, it's, it's less likely to land on surfaces if it's outside because there's more kind of air moving. So definitely outside if possible. And uh, to you, uh, Lily, I have a family child care provider from Oakland who wants to know um, if they if they don't want to have the nurse come in, can they still, if they're afraid about the nurse coming in, can they still participate in the program? Um, yes, they definitely can. Um, we can provide, um, we can provide consultation online, I mean, you know, um, through phone or Zoom or other different conferencing like that. Um, we also can provide, uh, if, if my students are putting together different um, things like, you know, the FAQ sheet or like um, uh, different games that they can do to, for the children for practicing how to do, you know, safe hand washing and things like that. All the things that they can do um, in person, they can at least give those resources to the centers. And we can definitely have uh, phone consultation, uh, you know, and even if it was twice a week, they had phone consultation with my students so they can give them some ideas of things to, you know, things to do to maybe help with health teaching. Um, that's their, we definitely are open to that. We would love to be able to get in there, but we realize that it's, it's, can be, it can be concerning for people to have someone else come in there. And, and so uh, I know that we've talked about uh, family child care groups, especially language groups for the uh, mental health consultation. Um, Maria, I have a, a center out in, in Livermore who is open now, but is planning to, but they're a serving a small number of children, but they're needing to bring their staff back as they open up to serve greater numbers of children. And they're wondering if the mental health consultation could help them with some of their staff anxiety about returning to work. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a completely normal response for for folks for staff to be feeling that way, to be experiencing those feelings. And the consultant can engage the staff in discussions that acknowledge and validate those emotions that everyone is experiencing um, and how that impacts them in their work. Um, additionally, the consultant can support the staff to identify and prioritize what they need in order to feel safe and to do their work effectively. So absolutely. Thank you. And Lisa, uh, we had a question. Um, from a center in Oakland who is interested, what's the best way for them to think about appropriately using their masks or, or uh, their face coverings? Oh, okay, can, can you hear me? I'm, I'm muted, right? Okay. Um, so Dr. Gerling actually uh, prepared this response. Um, and he basically says that when you put your masks on to make sure that your hands are clean um, or you use hand sanitizer before, uh, putting your masks on and um, make sure that you wash your face coverings um, periodically, especially if they become soiled or moist um, or if you touch them with unwashed hands. And I know we've gotten um, a lot of the materials and supplies out to folks. We're going to put a, a, so the link about the proper use and cleaning of the thermometers um, because we want to make sure you take care of your thermometers. And, um, and there are a lot of other good links just about all the things that everyone's talked about all day, I think, or all evening. Um, I think that's the time we have for questions right now. We do have other questions. Is there anything else from the group, from you all, that you feel like you didn't get a chance to hit on or you want to share with our, our providers on the call tonight? So that, that being said, it's getting late and we have, uh, we will be taking the questions that we didn't uh, get to tonight and making sure that we vet the answers for them and get them out and get them translated for everyone who's on this call and for those 
who weren't able to be on the webinar this evening. And I just want to thank you all. Um, next slide. So in addition to our group, there are or there is a resource that, um, that the state funds through California um, CIBC network. And we're, it, we may triage um, uh, providers to them depending on their capacity. Next slide. And these, are, again, these are general resources for you all. Um, that we've tried to line up the links. The health things are at the health department and then a lot of the other curated um, resources are at the Alameda County Early Care and Education Program and also on the FIRST 5 website um, for providers, you would click under the provider link. Next slide. The FAQ that uh, frequently asked questions that Lisa referenced that's a really long but but detailed document that is a good one place to go to um, about the advice from our county, right Lisa? She's shaking her head, yes. And uh, then the order, the health order guidance, and then those, those are places where um, that will change over time. And then as Lisa described, going through the phases and then specifics about disinfection recommendations and um, the health equity infographic. The links to the uh, isolation orders. And Lisa, those, cha those could change over time as well, correct? Um, they could, but they probably won't change anytime soon. Uh, right. Yeah. Or there may be new directives and we would just have- Yeah, to possibly, yeah. The field. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, and also the nurses, uh, as Lily described earlier, the nurses will stay on top of that and make sure that um, those of you in the field, if, as things change, are kept up to date. Um, and then here's- other resources that we have curated to make sure you have available. Next slide. Additional links. I mean, quite honestly, some of this, it feels like so much to take in. And I think it's really why it's helpful to just stay focused on some of these things where there's a checklist and that can be really helpful for those of you reopening. I know Angela Cabrera and others are working on um, teams for those of you who are reopening. And I, while, we're, while I'm talking about that, let, let me um, let you know that we are planning our next uh, webinar on reopening and, and doing some peer support for those who have been open and how their strategies are working and um, how, these supports in terms of um, how, you know, how, what's different in around screening and social distancing and the practices that are keeping children safe and staff safe and how folks are managing group size, et cetera. Next slide. And here's some CDC guidance for childcare programs that remain open and um, and then a response from CDC specifically. Next slide. And I think most of you really are expert in cleaning and disinfecting, um, but if you want to see the latest CDC guidance, here that is. Next slide. And the California Department of um, Social Services uh, it pin advisory on social distancing. Next slide. So I want to thank you all and just let you know that we appreciate you so much. We see you. We think about you every day. Um, we are amazed by you. And uh, we, we thank you for your frontline work and 
we are doing all we can do to get you the essential um, resources that you need and to fight for you around uh, state advocacy, federal um, advocacy, et cetera. And, um, to, and, and we are happy to hear from you what do you need so that we can keep that in the center of our mind? What are you seeing for families that we need to fight for, for children that we need to fight for, and for you who are caring for the children and, and, and indirectly those families? So um, I, I want to thank you all for your time this evening and the time you spend every day and your long days. And um, we look forward to um, hearing your response. Um, there will be an email going out after this uh, post webinar that will provide the slides, as I said, and will also give you another opportunity to, will embed the link for the behavioral health, mental health consultation intake, and then you'll be triaged to one of the, to either to Alameda County Behavioral Health or Hively. Um, and look for the health consultation application, which we expect to be coming out in the next couple weeks, um, coming to an inbox near you. Um, I wanna thank all of our panelists for your, your work every day and for your time this evening to talk to the field um, that so needs your support. And uh, I look forward to how we can institutionalize some of these um, most needed supports for our providers. Thank you all and good night and please share with your friends. Oh, I think there will be a post, is there a, a there also is a post evaluation of the webinar that, um, that you'll be receiving. And thank you very much and good night.